Well, guys, um, what I'm going to want to speak to you this morning is uh, how to create a missional church. Okay, now it's, it's an interesting uh, logo we got there, isn't there? <laughs> of a hand there. It looks like a, a Karl Marx hand, as it were. Don't worry, we're not promoting Marxism here in this church. So we're not doing that. We're not. We're not, we're not. But there's a sense in which uh, I believe that God wants us to have a a a, a, a a culture of revolution. Okay. Not a revolution in the sense that usurps authority that God has put, but a revolution that changes the, the wider culture of our world around us. And uh, what I want to speak to you on this morning is how to create what I call a missional culture. In other words, what I mean by that, a, 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 something that is missional is something that is reaching the world, that is engaging the world around us. And I believe that God wants us to cultivate a culture as a church that's constantly engaging the lost and reaching out to, the, to this world. Now, I just want to show you a little uh, picture on the screen here of uh, two athletes who uh, performed, were competing in the 1960 Olympics. They were both uh, part of the American discus, discus team. Uh, the person on the right was a guy called Al Orator. I think I pronounced his name right. The guy on the left was a guy called Rink Babke. And in the 1960, they were competing in the, in the, they were in the men's discus team. They were competing in the Olympics. And the night before um, the Olympic, the actual final event, Rink Babka on the left there fell ill. Okay, he didn't feel very well. He was had, I don't know, some tummy bug or whatever. But nevertheless, the following day, he was representing his team. He braved it. He went out. He competed with the team, with his teammate, Al Orator, and the rest of the guys. And the... In the, in, the, in the finals, it was really the best of five throws, okay? So uh, the first four throws, Rink Bagba on the left there was tanking it. He was winning, okay? He was on for gold. He was getting, he was getting the, the furthest distance. And then on the final and the last throw, Al Orator there on the right beat Rink Bagba, just outperforming him, and he ended up getting the gold medal, and Rink on the left there ended up getting the silver medal. Now you think, well, that's nothing spectacular about that, Matthew. That happens, isn't it? It's called Olympics, isn't it? Yes. But something interesting came to the surface a few years later. Apparently, during the fourth throw that the guy on the right, Al, Al Orator, was throwing, Rink Babba came to Al and said, hey, Al, you know what? Um, I've noticed there's something in your technique that when you're throwing. I think if you just tweak your technique a bit, I think you'll f throw further. Well, Al took on board Rink's advice, and he threw the discus, beating Rink, getting the gold medal. Now, I, I, I think we can all agree that, you know, that, hey, Rink Babbitt got a silver medal, but none of us would call him a loser by any means. He, there was something about his attitude that I think we would say is all good, that he wasn't in it for his own personal glory. He wasn't in it for himself. He was more concerned about the success of the team than he was about his own personal glory. In fact, Rink's attitude reminds me of the words of Paul uh, when he says that honor one another above yourselves. It's a wonderful way to live our life, isn't it? When you think about it, to honor others above ourselves. You see, as we start this new year, it is important you keep the big picture in mind that the goal of reaching this world with the gospel of Christ is infinitely more important than each of us reaching our own personal dreams or achievements. That to reach this world, we need to work as a team. <laughs> we need to be good team players. In fact, it was John Maxwell, who's a leadership writer, who famously said that teamwork makes the dream work. You may have heard it before. Teamwork makes the dream work. If as, we come, if, as we come into 2023, we are to have a culture that reaches the lost and reaches a wider, a wider community, then we need to value the importance of teamwork. And so we are starting this new series, as I mentioned, it's titled Culture Revolution, okay? And uh, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be looking at the Acts chapter 1, we're going to be looking at a verse, few verses of Scripture from this chapter, and we're going to be looking at what is the sort of culture that we need to have as a church to bring a good revolution in our wider world. You see, every church, every family, every home, 
every organization, a school, a workplace, a business has a culture. It's those unspoken assumptions, those values that people hold on to, that we just hold to, that shapes how we do things and how we see the world. Uh, you know, some churches have a culture that like to talk a lot about the past. And we, yeah, we could thank God for all the good things of the past. Some churches have a culture that speak all about the future or fixated with the present. Each church, each organization, each family, each school, each business has its own culture and it affects the way that that church or organization works itself. And so what are, as we unpack this series over these next few weeks, I want us to be looking at what sort of culture that we, do we need as a church to have if we are to reach this world with the gospel of Christ. And a very important part of that culture is understanding the value and the importance of teamwork. So given that teamwork makes the dream work, I want to ask, how can we create a missional culture? You see, one that reaches our world. See, after Jesus had ascended into heaven, and, and he was with his disciples, he ascended into heaven, two angels appeared to his disciples, and uh, they said, you know, what are you doing standing here looking up to heaven? <laughs> right? There's a mission for you to be getting on with. There's a task that I'm telling you that God is calling you to do, and you need to get on with it. And so we read in the book of Acts that they went back to their Jerusalem, and, and Luke records this, and then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying, and those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of, uh, son of James. And listen to this. They all joined together constantly in prayer. And that's a key phrase there. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his, and with his, uh, his, his brothers. And so, what we need to understand the context is this, okay? These guys have just witnessed the greatest, most significant event in history. <laughs> For the last 40 days, they have seen Jesus alive. He's given them many convincing proofs that he is indeed alive and risen from the dead. That encourages my faith. That's the foundation of my faith and your faith. We're, we're all here today because Jesus rose from the dead, aren't we? You know, and I've said this before, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, there's a lot of other things I could be doing <laughs> on a Sunday morning than, than being here. Because actually the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation, is the bedrock of our faith. It is what gives our lives significance and meaning and purpose in this broken world. And these guys have just witnessed the most important event in history. For many, Jesus has given them many convincing proofs that he is alive. And then prior to him ascending to heaven, Jesus said, Now guys, listen, you need to wait in Jerusalem for the next ten days until you're clothed with power from on high. And so Jesus ascends to heaven. And these guys are waiting in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to come. And this band of believers, as they gather together, we, we, we have the beginnings of what is about to be the world's most important, greatest movement in history. These band of followers are going to change the course of history. The world is going to be turned upside down from these people. And so they had, there was a culture that they had. There was a culture that they had that was going to revolutionize the world. And so I want us to look at this, this verse of Scripture, these 10 days where they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. What can we learn from these at this time as we step into this world? Because they had a missional culture that was primed to reach the world. So how then can we create a missional culture that values teamwork? The first thing is this. Number one, we need to be forward looking, be forward looking. There is a hill 
about three quarters of a mile from the city of Jerusalem. It's going to come on the, on the screen now. It's called the Mount of Olives. Now, when you look at this Mount of Olives, it doesn't look that significant. It's only just a small hill. It's about a little bit taller than, than, than Jerusalem. And uh, pretty, some you know, nice, nice greenery, some trees. Yeah, very, very, it's a nice, pretty place, but you wouldn't think, oh, nothing that significant. But you, know what? you need to know something. See, see that mount? <laughs> that place called the Mount of Olives? That is the most important place in the world. <laughs> Do you know why? Because the most significant event in history is going to occur on that mount. <laughs> For thousands of years, the Jewish people have buried their loved ones on the Mount of Olives. It was on the Mount of Olives that David, fleeing from his son Absalom, walked barefoot and he wept. It was on the Mount of Olives that after Jesus was teaching in the temple courts and having the Last Supper that he came and he prayed. It was on the Mount of Olives that Jesus taught his disciples, his followers, that someday he's going to come back again a second time. It was on this Mount of Olives of whom the angel said that this same Jesus, whom you've seen is taken up into heaven, will come back in the same way that you've seen him go into heaven. It is on this Mount of Olives that the prophet Zechariah said that someday the Messiah will touch his feet on this mountain and it will split in two. One will go north half and the other will go south. Apparently, I'm not a geologist, but I understand that in the Mount of Olives there is actually a, a fault line that is preparing for that day. It was from the Mount of Olives that Jesus sent two of his disciples to get a donkey. <laughs> and he rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, going through the east gate as a foreshadow of the day when he will come a second time as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And the kingdom of God will come on earth in force. And Jerusalem <laughs> will be the capital of the world. It won't be New York, it won't be Brussels, it won't be Moscow, it won't be London. It'll be Jerusalem. And the King of Kings will reign from Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives is the most important place, in my view, on this planet. Because that's where the future lies. Now, what I, why do I say that? I say that because for the dream to work, <laughs> we need to understand what the dream is. Jesus is coming back again. He is coming back again. I'm glad about that. <laughs> For those who love him, we're looking forward to it. For those who are his enemies, it's going to be a bad day for them. Christ is coming back again in his glory and his majesty with his powerful angels. He will just, and that time, there's no more time to repent from our sins. <laughs> there's no more time because God's giving enough time for the inhabitants of the earth to turn to him to hear the gospel of Christ, when he comes back again, he's going to come in power and in majesty and in in glory. And it's important that we understand that and that we see that. Because we need to look forward to his coming. Because if we don't look forward to his coming, we will lose an impetus to engage our world. To bring the kingdom of God in our world. And that's why for all of us here today, our role as followers of Jesus is to prepare a way for Jesus to come in our homes, in our communities, in our, in our churches, in the world around us, that we are actively engaging in the work of the kingdom of God in this broken world. In fact, it's interesting that these men had to move from Jerusalem from, to the hill, uh, from the hill called the Mount of Olives. In other words, they had to no longer stand on the Mount of Olives, but they had to go to Jerusalem to gauge in the task that God uh, was calling him to do. Now, I, now there, was, there was an interesting event that happened a few hundred years ago. It was on the, the 19th of May, 1780, in the states of New England and Connecticut. And it's been recorded that from about 11 a.m. to about 12 a.m., 12 a, a strange darkness came all over the states. Now, some think it may have been the result of maybe some forest fires or uh, fog. There wasn't a solar eclipse or anything like that. A strange darkness came, 
And people were, it was all documented, recorded from a number of different sources, and people were panicking. What's going on here? And of course, it was a very much of a, a God-aware a culture then, uh, much more than it probably is now. And people thought, is it the end of the world? <laughs> is, is Jesus coming back again? And in the state of Connecticut, there was a, there were some court proceedings being carried out. And there was a judge by the name of Colonel Abraham Davenport. And uh, he was proceeding the court. And next minute, a strange darkness comes all over. I think, what's going on here? Everyone's starting to panic. What's going on? And, and uh, people are saying, we should adjourn the proceedings of the court. We should stop it. Uh, because the day of the Lord is about to hear. The end is nigh. And Colonel Davenport uh, says, said, it was quoted as saying, I'm against adjourning the court proceedings. I'm against it. It says, either this is the day of the Lord or it isn't. <laughs> now, if it's not the day of the Lord, it doesn't make any difference. So we might as well keep on doing what we're meant to be doing. And if it is the day of the Lord, then I'd rather Jesus find me doing my task when he returns than not. That's a great attitude, isn't it? You know, sometimes, you know, I, I grew up in a, in, a, in a church setting where you know, the second coming of Christ was talked a lot, and, and that was a good thing. But sometimes it can almost be like a... a a, an over-concern of his coming at the detriment of what we're meant to be doing now. Because when we look at the coming of Christ, we need to realize it is to motivate us to do something in our world right now at this moment in time. And so we need to be faithful to the task. We need to be forward-looking, but faithful to the task that God has given us. And so that's the first thing we need to have. We need to have a missional culture that values teamwork. The second thing is this. Be leadership honoring. Now you think, oh, Matthew, that's cheap coming from you. <laughs> but actually, in every field of life, in every aspect of life, honoring leaders is important. And it does go both ways. Because in our Western culture today, I would say that generally there can be a, a disrespect of leaders, okay, more so than other cultures. But the other side, of course, is that leaders need to be worthy people people who understand their role and the responsibility and worthy to, to follow. If we are to take hold of the dream to reach in this world, then we need to respect leadership authority. When Luke mentions that those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James... He, along with all the gospel writers, recognized that there is an orderliness in how these 11 apostles are designated and mentioned. And therefore, there's a sense of endearment and respect is being afforded to them as the founding fathers of this new global community of the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, before highlighting the notable absence of Judas Iscariot from Luke's list, it's worth mentioning that when you look at the gospels, Peter is almost always mentioned first amongst the twelve. And obviously because Peter was the strongest of the leaders of, of them all. And then you get James and John. So Peter, James and John were part of Jesus' inner circle. And then uh, Peter's brother Andrew. And that keeps in Hebrew tradition that families were often uh, named amongst themselves. And likewise, as with the other gospel writers, the next four, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, are named and again, this pattern is repeated with James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, the son of James. And so this orderliness, which is seen in all the gospel writers, in my view, reveals a recognized levels of influence and authority that these leaders had that was to be respected. On a number of occasions, the writer of Hebrews emphasizes the importance of this. He says this, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Now, I don't know about you, but you know, when I read that, that terrifies me. <laughs> because I realize that I have a responsibility before God to live a life that is worthy of the, of the gospel. And for all of us here, I believe that we should all aspire to to become leaders, to be better leaders, to have influence of other people. And for all of us here, it puts the onus upon us to say, Lord, am I going to live my life in a way that is in, in accord with the gospel of Christ? 
And so the writer says, remember your leaders. So there's an onus that's put upon leaders to live their lives in a way that is honoring to God. And come to think of it, that is why Judas Iscariot is no longer included in the list of those names. Why? Because he turned his back on Christ. He was greedy for personal gain. And the result was he was no longer regarded as a leader amongst the people of God. And yet on the back of this, the writer of Hebrews then goes on to say, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. Oh, we don't like that word, don't we? <laughs> submit. <laughs> because they keep watch over you as those to whom must give an account. I have to give an account <laughs> before the Lord. Any pastor, any leader of any church has to give an account before God of the condition of their church that God's given to them. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. You know, I, I remember many moons ago when I started to teach, and forgive me, because I sometimes go back to this every so often, and I know you, you're very patient with me, you put up with me in all of this. But I remember uh, when I started to teach, and I remember a teacher, a uh, seasoned teacher, uh, saying to me in, kind of in this conversation, do you know what makes a good teacher? I'm thinking, okay, what makes a good teacher? Is it uh, assertive discipline techniques? Is it the accelerated learning technique? It's all good lesson planning and all this, this stuff. I said, God, enlighten me. What makes a good teacher? A good class. <laughs> a good class, yes. The truth is this. You can have the best teacher in the world, the most knowledgeable, experienced teacher, but you know, if the class does not respect the teacher, it doesn't matter how much they know. It's just not going to work. I mean, at the time I taught, I had a whole range of classes. I mean, I had some wonderful, adorable, beautiful classes. And I had some classes who I thought were from the pit of hell. <laughs> Lord, God, just get me through this, Lord. You know, some were really were a nightmare. But the truth is this. It's the same when it comes to Leaders and followers, and in, in, in every aspect of life, the Bible instructs us we are to honor our leaders. In fact, those readings in Hebrews gives a, a beautiful balance, doesn't it? Because yes, we are to honor our leaders, we are to respect them, but at the same time, leaders are not to be greedy for gain, but that they are to understand the responsibility that has been given before them and, and, and before God. And when there's that harmony between leaders and followers... You have a wonderful missional culture. When it's not, it gets toxic. It gets poisonous. In fact, I've been to churches where it's got toxic, and it's never good. It's never healthy. And so let's, uh, yes, let's be forward-focused. Let's be leadership honoring. The third thing that we need to cultivate to have a missional culture that values teamwork, and that is this, be spiritually united. I don't know if you, did you ever remember the scene in the film Gladiator? Now you're thinking, oh, Matthew, I'm too holy to watch the Gladiator. I, you know, listen, don't give me that holier than thou look at me. <laughs> but you remember that scene in the film Gladiator where Maximus Meridius <laughs> and his band of gladiators are in the Colosseum. And, they're, and they're, they're about to face the onslaught about whatever's to come out of the gates of the Colosseum. And Maximus Aridius, played by Russell Crowe, says, were any of you in the army? Yes. <laughs> says, whatever comes out of these gates, we must lock your shields and you must stay as one. And as long as you lock your shields and as you stay as one, we'll survive. We'll get through it. See, there's power and unity, isn't there? There's power and unity. In fact, the Bible says that where the brethren dwell together in unity, there God commands His blessing. He, he brings His blessing when there, when there is unity. And, uh, and what was interesting is that you know, when someone strayed from their place, they were cut down. But as they stayed united, as they locked their shields, they overcame the odds. You know, one feature about this community uh, of these followers of Jesus and I think this is the one that stands out to me the most about this reading is this. They all joined together constantly in prayer. Wow. They all joined together constantly in prayer. 
can I encourage you guys, you know, if you're not part of a life group, get, in, get plugged into a life group. But in your life groups, make the most of praying together. Praying as a life group. Praying at every opportunity you get just to, to join together constantly in prayer. Because I believe that more than anything else, prayer unites us. Prayer gets us on God's agenda. That's why we start this year, these 21 days of prayer and fasting, because we're saying, Lord, we want to be on your agenda for this coming year. Prayer unites us. Now think about this for a moment, okay? All these guys that I just mentioned earlier on, they all had ego issues, all right? <laughs> Peter had foot and mouth disease. He would say things and then he would put his foot in there. Peter, today, tonight, you're going to deny me three times. No, I'm not, Lord. When all those guys have abandoned you, I'm going to be there right with you. I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'll die with you, I have to. Well, guess what? <laughs> he bottled it. He denied Jesus in front of a girl, which is like the worst thing for a man to do. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. <laughs> he bottled it. James and John. Oh, yeah, they didn't have an agenda. <laughs> oh, they, they, they got their mother to go to Jesus. Jesus, <laughs> see my two sons, James and John? Can they sit at your right and left hand and your kingdom? What? <laughs> no, you don't have an agenda, guys, don't you? Self-serving, they, on one occasion they said, Lord, you know, those guys in those, that Samaritan village are denying, we're going to call down fire and burn them up. And Jesus rebuked them. <laughs> Simon the Zealot made an earning killing the Romans. That's what he used to do. And then you got Matthew the tax, tax collector who worked for the Romans. I mean, how does that work, having those two guys on your team? They all had ego issues. They're all issues in this team. And yet something changed that joined them together. They have just witnessed the most significant event in history, and now suddenly their egos no longer seem important. They had a common experience with a common Lord. They had a common purpose and a common hope with the same mind. They joined together. In fact, this word here, they constantly joined together. I mentioned that prayer is a, is a key to this. The Greek word homotheo literally means to be of the same mind. And, and, and it's used four occasions, specifically in the book of Acts. Twice it, it relates and is associated in the context of prayer, and twice it relates when the, when the church will come together to unite, to be of the same mind. Prayer unites and empowers you and me for mission. And that's why we are doing these 21 days of prayer and fasting, because we're saying, God, we want to be on the same page we want to be on your agenda as we start this year. We want to be united in the purpose that you call us to, to, towards as we come into this year. And that word constantly, okay, it's the same word that is used when the talk talks about they devoted themselves to the apostles' prayer and, and to the apostles' teaching and to the breaking of bread. So there was a devotion to prayer and to, and to join, being joined together. Prayer is the powerhouse of a church. It is the power behind what we do as we come into this, uh, into this season. And it is the precursor, I believe, to, be, to being open and receiving more of the Spirit as we start this year. But there's one other thing that we can learn from these words if we're to uh, have a missional culture that values teamwork, and that is be people gathering. In other words, be prepared to gather people who may not necessarily be like you, <laughs> okay? Prepare to go that extra mile. A couple of years ago, I, I, I brought a series to the church called Exclusive Inclusivity, I called it. Living a life that is exclusive for God, for His service, leading a holy life, but also inclusive of the outsiders, inclusive of those people who may not be like, uh, like us. And what I find interesting about this community of believers is that Luke goes on to say that they all join constantly together in prayer, doing, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And I find that interesting. Because in a culture that was very segregated, 
you know, where men would be separated from women or whatever. The women are with the men. They're worshiping together. I, I find that a, a fascinating. In fact, Jesus has done more for the dignity of womanhood than anyone else. Think about this. The women were the last at the cross. <laughs> they were the first to witness the resurrection of Jesus. And now here they are, along with the men in this, in this setting. There's no segregation of age. There's young and old there. Jesus' his mother is there. There's no segregation of past lives. Jesus' his brothers are there. In fact, you remember, these are the guys who didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't put their faith in Christ when he was alive. They thought, oh, we know Jesus. He's just our brother. He's our stepbrother. There was a bit of some question marks about how he was born and all that, and I'm sure there was a bit of sniggering about that. And yet something changed in them. When they saw him on that cross, it confirmed all their suspicions. Yeah, he thought he was some son of God. But now they've seen the risen Christ. And all of that has changed. And here they are amongst this band of, of, of followers, this small group of believers who are about to change the course of history. And I want to say for all of us here today, if we're to make the dream work, yeah, teamwork is needed. And a, an important part of that is to be prepared to bridge and to, to build bridges with people who may not be like you, okay? To go that extra mile. And I want to encourage us all to do that. In fact, let me encourage you over these next 21 days to invite someone out for a coffee. <laughs> or maybe go for a meal that you haven't invited before. Go that extra mile to make that connection, to build that relationship, to be people gathering. There are so many lonely people in our world. And I was there the other week, last Friday, uh, when I was at the street church, uh, I spoke to this young guy, and I said, you know, what, what did you do at Christmas? Oh, I just, I just stayed on my own. He says, they don't have family. They don't have relatives. They don't have people close in my life. And I just felt so sorry for this guy. There's so much need out there. People are looking for a sense of community. I want to encourage us all here to do what we can to be people gathering. So 2023 is going to be a year of strengthening and expansion, and, and for us as a church, and I pray for us personally, in our families, in our friendships, and uh, our vocations, and as we engage this wider culture with the message of Christ, for teamwork to make the dream work, let's be forward-looking, let's be leadership-honoring, let's be spiritually united, let's be people-gathering. Nothing of any significance is accomplished on our own. <laughs> Nothing. We need each other as we come into this new, new, new year. And I want to encourage us all here today to take those steps. If, to, if this morning um, you don't have a feel you have any sense of direction or purpose in life, or even feel that you have a family to belong to, you need to know that when you come to Jesus, you have a purpose for your life, and you have a family to belong to. And if you've not uh, yet uh, come to know Christ as your personal Savior and the leader of your life, I want to invite you uh, this morning to turn from everything that you know is wrong, put your trust in Christ, in an act of obedience, get immersed in water in His name, open your heart, receive of His Spirit, and step in to the dream that God has for us. Uh, because we need teamwork for the dream to work as we come into this year, 2023. I mean, let's, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace on our lives. I just pray that, Father, Lord, as we step into this new year, that, Father, that you will equip us as a church, that you'll prepare us as a church for everything that is about to happen, that you're about to bring. I pray for, the, for the, the new people that you bring into us as a church. I pray, help us, Lord God, to be people gathering, Lord. Help us, Father, to have a culture of honor that goes both ways, between leaders and followers, Lord. Help us to have a, a culture that is forward-looking. God, Lord, that, that Christ, that you are coming back again. Help us, Lord, to unite in prayer. Help us to walk in prayer. Lord, I pray that None of our egos 
will get in the way from what you want to do. Lord, we can sometimes have our thoughts, but actually it's your thoughts and it's your plan and it's what you want to do. And we just submit it all to you, God. And we pray, Heavenly Father, as we come into this year, that, Lord, that you'll guide our steps and that you'll lead us into the future that you have for us, Lord. We ask this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. If there anyone here is here present or maybe watching online and you, know, you haven't yet uh, come to that place of putting your trust in Christ, I'm going to just uh, pray this prayer. I'm going to invite you just to repeat these words uh, after me in your heart. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong in my life. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I can be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive that gift and invite you to come into my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.